So welcome to June's Cook Right, Eat Right. My name is Michelle Riley. I am a registered dietitian and an assistant professor of hospitality and dietary management out at Johnson County Community College, and we're really glad to have you guys here today. Um, this presentation, we're going to be looking all about healthy fats. So I'm sure this is something that we get questions about all the time. So we're really excited to have you. I'm going to first introduce our registered dietitian. So Nicolette Jones is a registered dietitian with the University of Kansas Hospital. Um, she has been there for about four years and focuses mostly on cardiac. So she works in lots of areas with um, heart failure and other things. And Nicolette works both outpatient and inpatient. So she has a great experience working with this population. So healthy fats is a great topic for her to discuss. So we're really excited to have her. So please welcome Nicolette. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, I'm Nicolette, um, so I'll start us off. Sorry if this mic is a little loud, but um, so really, we're really kind of focusing on the types of fats that are uh, can be in our diet. Which ones are going to be really those heart healthy, overall body healthy fats, and which ones we want to kind of think about our intake and even decrease our intake um, as much as we can. So we'll kind of go through. Um, the highs and lows. Um, so this, I love this picture because it kind of shows you how different fats uh, can be composed of not just the heart healthy fats, but also can have a little bit of the not so healthy fats as well. Um, so it goes from, you know, the majority of the fat being saturated fat um, to more so these different types of fats um, that are more heart healthy and anti-inflammatory. So uh, not every fat is just pure heart healthy fat. There may be a little bit here and there of that saturated fat creeping in there. Um, but just to kind of really show us what we're going to be kind of reviewing today. So wide variety. So let's start with that saturated fat. So within that little picture that you saw, that's going to be that red color that we saw. Um, so saturated fats are going to be more so solid at room temperature. So if you think of butter, kind of sitting in that butter dish, that's going to be mostly saturated fat. Um, also your fatty meats. So if you think of the marbling and that red meat at the butcher counter, that's going to be more saturated fat. And you're also going to get saturated fat more so from lard, which sounds delicious. Um, your poultry skin, so if you think of that fried chicken skin on there, um, and also a lot of dairy products. So if you think of full fat yogurt, um, whole milk, cheese, um, you're going to be getting mostly that saturated fat intake. So there are some plant-based saturated fats. So that's going to be your palm oil, palm kernel oil, and your coconut oil. So coconut oil is a hot topic right now. Um, so I'm definitely going to address that later. Uh, but it's truly a saturated fat. And so our daily intake recommendation is 13 grams per day um, as a general amount, usually 11 to 15 if we want to get in a range. Um, and the reason for that is the most extensive research that we found is that the um, more that we decrease our intake of saturated fat, we are improving our cholesterol numbers. So we're seeing that improvement with that. Um, it reduces your total cholesterol. Um, your triglycerides, your LDL, which is more your lousy cholesterol number, and it can also improve your weight because fats in general tend to be more dense in calories than any other nutrient that we eat. So carbohydrates, proteins, fats, those are the big three of our nutrients that we have. So overall, reducing your saturated fat intake can help reduce your heart disease risk and the kind of numbers that come with your lipid profile. All right, so trans fats. So this is kind of a big one here. Um, so saturated fats, we kind of said, eh, kind of limit your intake, make sure that you're not having too much. Um, backtracking a little bit, you know, depending upon what you prefer in your diet. So for me, I like cheese. So I think I'm going to use most of my saturated fat intake to really allow myself that indulgence. Same with you, if you want a piece of red meat every so often, make sure that you're kind of comparatively reducing your saturated fat intake in other areas. So that's how you can kind of limit that. But trans fats here, 
these are artificial. So these are really ones that are not going to be in a piece of meat or in, um, you know, coconut oil. They're more, more so artificial. Um, and so these are created from a type of oil, mostly soybean oil is what you'll see. Um, and what they do is they go through the process of hydrogenation, not to sound too sciencey, uh, but the reason that they're in our food supply is because they're cheap, they keep those products lasting for a long time, um, and a lot of the time with um, fryer oils at certain restaurants or bars and grills, they can use that fryer oil multiple times if it's higher in trans fats. So if you're getting french fries with every meal, you increase your risk for taking in more of those trans fats. So what do trans fats do for our body? They're gonna raise our LDL, that's our lousy cholesterol, okay? Um, and they're going to actually lower our HDL, which is our heart healthy cholesterol. I always use kind of the terminology where your HDL is like the garbage men in the body. They're cleaning out, they're taking out the trash. The LDL are kind of the party people that are throwing trash everywhere in the, in the body. So again, HDL is those garbage men that are picking up the trash, so that's what we want. So trans fats are gonna increase your risk for heart disease, stroke, and also can increase your risk for diabetes. Um, you know, if we think about what trans fats are gonna be in, it's gonna be in those donuts, it's gonna be in those french fries, it can be in snack foods. I've seen it in pancake mix, in um, peanut butter. So really uh, kind of looking at that label and that's something that we'll discuss later. So let's get to the good stuff. Right, so monounsaturated fats, these are part of the heart healthy group of fats. These are usually liquid at room temperature, um, but if you put like a salad dressing or something like that in the refrigerator, you may notice that it gets a little solid. Um, these are gonna help, again, reduce your LDL um, cholesterol levels. So again, kind of combating um, what the saturated fat and the trans fats might do. If you replace your intake with those monounsaturated fats, you're gonna decrease that LDL. Can lower your risk for heart disease and for stroke. Stroke was a big topic last month with this program. Um, we get vitamin E, so not just vitamin E, but um, fats in general that are heart healthy are gonna help our body um, with those types of vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E, um, and vitamin K as well. Uh, so these can help improve insulin sensitivity when we replace these or replace saturated fat and some carbohydrates with more of the monounsaturated fats. So that was kind of um, the results of some of the studies that have been done on the monounsaturated fats. And a list here of some of the high monounsaturated fat foods. You have that classic olive oil that you hear all about, uh, canola oil, your avocado. Avocado is really big right now. You can put it on basically anything. Um, and your nuts and seeds. So if you think of um, almonds or um, pecans, whatever you fancy, all of those are gonna provide that good, heart healthy, mono unsaturated fats. And there was an avocado on there. Look how cute that is. <laughs> so I thought that was cute. All right, so for the poly unsaturated fats, these are the most heart healthy for us. Um, these provide essential fats for our body. Um, and we get those um, in the forms of omega-6s and omega-3s um, to help with certain functions within our body. You're gonna find these um, omega-6s and omega-3s in soybean oil, sunflower oil, your fatty fishes, like your salmon, your tuna, mackerel. Um, those are really important ones. Usually I tell patients, uh, increase your fish intake to a couple times a week or more. Um, that way you really get that omega-3 benefit um, to kind of help with reduction of inflammation, uh, brain power, so there's a lot of things that those omega-3s can do for us. Um, you can get it from nuts, so if you're not a fish person, you can get omega-3 benefits from walnuts. Um, you can do uh, with the um, canola oil, that's one thing that you can kind of get some omega-3s from as well, um, but in general, um, especially if you're taking a fish oil supplement, I usually say one to two grams per day of those specific EPA and DHA omega-3s. Um, and so the reason for that is some of the research that I've read, you're gonna get the most benefits from that particular amount. 
Um, one of the questions I get a lot is, how do I know what fish oil supplement is going to be the best for me? You know, if, especially if you're not a big fish person or if it's too expensive. This is kind of one thing that we obviously um, deal with with patients. Um, you want to look on the label and make sure you're getting at least a gram of that EPA and DHA. So that's kind of an indication that you can kind of look at your supplements and see how many pills do I really have to take to get that benefit and try to find the most concentrated one. I didn't mean to go off into supplements, but I get that question a lot, so I thought I'd share it. All right, so I really love this table here because it shows those MUFAs and PUFAs. We call those the, the unsaturated fats. Um, this kind of gives you um, an idea of, okay, what's my issue? Do I have an increased total cholesterol? Is my doctor telling me that my LDL cholesterol is high? This is kind of what the research has found when you replace those um, saturated fats for the monounsaturated fats, when they replace your carbohydrate intake, not saying carbohydrates are bad, that's a whole different topic, but if you replace you know, those more refined carbohydrates maybe, uh, or the sweets for those monounsaturated fats, you can see how kind of the benefits lie with that. And then over there with the, the PUFAs, so the polyunsaturated fats, we can see you know, those great uh, differences within the research. So uh, depending upon you, what your goal is, you can really see uh, the changes uh, with depending upon which ones you want to increase. All right, so this is the big topic. I'm sure everyone came here to learn more about coconut oil. Okay, so coconut oil is mostly saturated fat, and we talked before, saturated fat intake, we're kind of thinking don't add too much in your diet. We know that it can increase your cholesterol levels. Um, so why is it in the media, why is it so important? Why are people saying that it's different than your usual saturated fats? It does contain medium chain triglycerides, or MCTs. Um, again, don't want to get too sciencey. Um, but these are the kind of types of fats that are really getting a lot of that attention. Um, and a lot of the research that um, has promoted coconut oil really only uses those concentrated MCTs for those studies. Um, the studies are still very small, limited amount of participants. Um, so as professionals, we don't tell you to smother it on everything or put it on your steak. We still want you to pay attention to the amount that you're taking in. So from a culinary standpoint, and I'm sure we'll get to learn more about that later, but um, it's stable, has a long shelf life, and um, the melting point at 76 degrees, kind of use that to your advantage there. Um, it's non-dairy, so if we have vegan um, people that are kind of interested in using something other than butter for those higher heat cooking techniques, um, you can use that. So the MCT, going back to that, you're going to see that that improves absorption, specifically for patients who are having issues digesting fat. So it goes through a different pathway in the body. Um, so MCTs can be appropriate if you have issues with your pancreas, specifically pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis, um, or any other fat malabsorption issue. So, you know, kind of thinking, okay, do I really need to start using coconut oil? If you have some of these issues, um, that could maybe be a reason to utilize it. So, some of the claims that we're seeing, and I kind of wanted to bring about some of the, the research portion of it. Again, try not to get too sciencey. Um, but again, these obesity claims um, that it can help really with weight loss. Um, really small studies here, less than 100 participants. Um, we usually like to see research with a lot of participants to really have it be a claim that we can encourage the general public to do. Um, there is the possibility that it can increase your metabolism, but it's not by hundreds and thousands of calories. We still have to be mindful of our intake and the amount. Um, Small but positive changes in um, weight loss in the waist to hip ratio, um, but again, small studies. Um, your cardiovascular and lipid claims, so there is some um, thought that 
you know, you can have as much as you want and it's not going to affect your cholesterol levels at all. Um, some studies showed improvements, but overall there were studies that didn't show improvements. So, you know, it's apples to oranges there. There's also antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial claims here. Again, bottom line, there's a lot more research that needs to happen with larger uh, participant studies before someone like me is going to say, use as much as you want. Again, I talked a little bit about how I'm a cheese fan and I'm going to use my saturated fat towards cheese. If you really want to utilize your saturated fat intake towards coconut oil, it's okay. Again, we have that 11 to 15 gram amount to kind of play with. So um, it can be incorporated within a healthy diet, but one food is not a cure-all, okay? So we really want to incorporate balance and overall healthy diet for overall a nutritious lifestyle. All right, hopefully I answered some of your questions for that or else we'll hear them later. Good. So omega-3 versus omega-6. So this is kind of something that's come about some um, research again about um, how if the diet is higher in omega-6s versus omega-3s that that can cause inflammation in the body. Um, so we want to make sure, you know, some of the omega-6s can kind of break down into those pro-inflammatory uh, products. But again, more research. So breaking down a lot of the stuff that we're hearing in the media, um, don't want to keep saying, oh, well, we really don't know. Um, we, we know that omega-3s are going to really help with inflammation. And so really balancing the intake of your omega-6s and your omega-3s can really be that good place to start. We get a lot of omega-6s from soybean oil, sunflower, safflower, and those oils are used a lot in our food supply. So by no means do you need to seek out more omega-3s. You're probably getting them already within your diet, but those omega-3s that are in your salmon, your walnuts, your flaxseed, those are ones that we don't really get as much of as a culture, so that can be the goal, trying to balance your intake with that. So let's talk about label reading. Um, so this is kind of where we really apply all of that stuff that I said before and really kind of looking at the products that you have in your pantry already, that you have um, you know, while you're wandering the grocery store, how do I know if this is going to be the good type of fat that I want to be taking in? So you see total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat on the food label for the most part. Some products will list polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat. If you see that, that's great. More information. Um, usually, uh, for total fat, we want to see less than five grams of total fat per serving. So for your total intake for the day, that's about 50 to 75 grams of fat for 2,000 calories. So for men, you may be within that range. Women, we tend to be a little bit less than that. Um, so it really kind of depends on your age, your lifestyle, your activity level. But overall, that kind of range is something that you can, on average, kind of uh, go for. Um, for your saturated fat, we want to make sure that it's less than 2 grams uh, per serving. That makes sure that the, you know, in the ratio between saturated fat and total fat, all of the fat in that product isn't necessarily all saturated fat. So if you see saturated fat less than 2 grams, but the total fat, especially on this example, is 11 grams, we can be confident that that other 9 grams is probably those heart-healthy types of fats, especially when trans fat is zero. So June 2018, this month, the FDA is supposed to be really taking out that trans fat from our food supply. So fingers crossed. Everything that I'm telling you, we kind of can say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about trans fats anymore. But it's important to be a good consumer and kind of keep track of, especially the ingredient list. So really, that's where you're going to want to look and see what type of fat are they adding in there. Um, and one little trick that the food companies can do, the trans fat can still can say zero if it's 0.5 grams or less. So... Even though it says zero, you may be sneaking in a little bit of that trans fat. Because who always monitors the serving size of every single food that they're eating? 
I mean, if you do, I'm really jealous because sometimes you just pour something in or ladle something in and it's really difficult to stick with that half cup. Um, so trying to monitor the serving size of those foods. So really what you're looking for on the ingredient list is partially hydrogenated oil. Those are those trans fats that can sneak into your food. Um, Again, it kind of touches on that with that half gram or less. So really looking for the partially hydrogenated oil. If you see that, maybe leave that food on the shelf at the grocery store. Try to incorporate something more natural. So comparatively, you may see a regular peanut butter and then a natural peanut butter. So that probably usually is going to cut out those trans fats. But hopefully, the FDA is going to do that for us. Calories from fat is a place that you can look as well to see comparatively how much calories um, of that serving size is going to be from the actual fat. For reference, about a tablespoon of fat is 100 calories. So I touched on before how fats can be pretty um, dense in calories. Um, so while they're heart healthy for us, some of them, um, we can get a lot of those very quickly. So paying attention to portion size there and the calories from fat can kind of show you a little bit into that uh, for you know those of us who are counting calories. Okay, so tips and tricks here. So kind of you know bringing it all together. What is Nicolette saying? What, what am I supposed to be doing at home? I think eating uh, fatty fish at least twice a week can really help boost your omega threes. Omega-3 omega intake, again, that EPA and DHA, really important for um, reducing those cholesterol levels, uh, reducing your LDL cholesterol. Um, there's some good research on brain function, brain health, boosting that serotonin level. Um, snack on a handful of nuts instead of sweets. So we touched on how when we replace um, carbohydrates or saturated fat with those heart-healthy fats, we see um, those good results with our cholesterol levels. That's kind of what that trick is about. Add texture and creaminess to a sandwich with avocado. So sounds delicious. You can use that instead of mayonnaise um, or any other kind of higher saturated fat condiments. Add some avocado for that creaminess. When baking, you can do um, three tablespoons of olive oil instead of a quarter cup of butter. Um, and then you can substitute all or one half of the butter in your recipe with canola oil, so kind of the same thing. Um, so for big bakers, trying to find that substitute there, um, but for the most part, finding little spots where you can incorporate those healthy fats, because not only are they going to give you that heart health, but they're really going to help you feel satisfied. And so, you know, if you're snacking, you know, we never want to feel that crash after we're snacking, because then we're going right back to something you know, sweet or maybe something a little bit um, not as healthy. So really going for um, those healthy fats can help keep that blood sugar a little bit more stable throughout the day, keep your focus, um, and really overall body health with those heart healthy fats. So, all right, I'll hand it over. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Nicolette. Um, now I would like to introduce Chef Jerry Marcellus. So Chef Marcellus has been teaching at Johnson County Community College for about 18 years. I know he looks so young, you can't believe it, um, but he's, he's great. Uh, he teaches a lot of our culinary classes and also does our chef apprenticeship program. So we're very lucky to have him and he's got some great recipes to demo for you today. All right, good evening. Thank you all for coming. So I'm going to show you a couple of things this evening. And one of the things I'm going to show you is a great way to get a little more salmon into your diet or those other types of fish. So what I'm going to show you how to do this evening is a very, very classic dish called fish and papillote. So we're, we're literally cooking the fish in paper. And, and what's so great about this dish, this is actually a very classic way to teach fish, and we're actually steaming the salmon. So 
I'm going to show you how to make this, but the finished product is ready and we can't leave fish in the oven longer than we need to. So this is what the dish looks like when it comes out of the oven. And the great thing about this dish is, is one of the things that's so great about this dish is the very, very dramatic presentation that you get. So the classically, this dish was intended to be brought table side looking just like this. And the server opens the packet at the guest table. So we're going to open it up. And when the server opens the packet, you should get a big rush of steam out of the packet. And you should get all the aromas of the fish. So, so we tear it open. And you get all these beautiful aromas of the fish. And, and actually, Professor, we did pretty well. We were perfect on our timing. I'm not really sure how I got talked into cooking fish in a live demo because <laughs> fish is always. <laughs> so to make this dish, it, it's very, very simple. So probably about the trickiest thing about this dish is creating the parchment packet. And one of the things you may have trouble finding is the parchment paper. Perhaps, maybe, if you shop at a Sam's Club or a Costco, they'll have these big full-size sheets of parchment paper. I know when I go to the grocery store, I buy the brown paper on a roll. I don't know that you'll ever be doing a full side as we are here. Perhaps you may be. Um, but if you're going to do one fillet, one small fish fillet, the parchment paper that you buy at the store will be fine. You can also do this in a foil packet in a pinch. So I typed up a recipe for you, and uh, I know it's a little vague, and I did that intentionally because I teach predominantly beginning and intermediate culinary arts. And I think especially today when the culinary world is driven by recipes, 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 I don't think people are learning enough culinary technique. And I'm telling you, as a chef, if you can master culinary technique, you can master any recipe. So my wish for you as a food enthusiast is to be able to read a recipe and go simply, oh, well, that's just a steaming technique. So anyway, I'm rambling a little bit here. But I built a lot of flexibility into this recipe. So to cook in papillot, which loosely translated means in paper, you're going to start with a big piece of parchment paper, and you're going to cut it like a valentine, right? Remember in grade school when you did this, you folded the piece of paper in half, and you just cut a heart. I didn't take so much off the top of mine because I have a very large piece of fish that I need to fit in here. But, but it's okay to get a little more rounded on the top. You do want to make sure that you oil the outside of the paper. That's very important. You don't want the paper to burn. You don't want the paper to burst open. So we're going to oil the outside. We don't need to oil the inside. And I'm using a good quality extra virgin olive oil. And we want to kind of hit it right in the middle. We don't want it too dry. We don't want it too greasy. And then we're going to set our piece of paper on a sheet pan. This is what we're going to cook it in. This is what's going to support the whole package while it's in the oven. OK, so back to the technique part. Keep in mind, this is just simply a steaming technique. We're just steaming it in a paper pa in a paper packet as opposed to a steamer basket. You have steamer baskets. Go buy yourself some steamer baskets. They're awesome. Uh, very healthy way to cook, by the way. But we're just going to steam this in a, in a parchment packet. So the recipe calls for mirepoix. Does anybody know what mirepoix is? 
Mirepoix is a fran fancy French word for a combination of carrots, onions, and celery, right? I remember as a very young food enthusiast, and this is a true story, getting my hands on a cookbook and asking people where I could go buy mirepoix. It's like, seriously, that's all it is. <laughs> so it, it's uh, onions, carrots, celery. That's all it is. These are what we refer to as the aromatics. These are the very, very basics. You can substitute things out if you like. I'll get to that in a second. So all we're doing here is creating a bed for the fish to sit on. The steam is going to pass through these vegetables, and mirepoix always bring flavor to the party. I actually say that in class. Students think I'm such a dork. <laughs> But they do. Mirepoix always brings flavor to the party. It's kind of a standard preparation in classical cuisine. Fennel would work in this application very well. It would actually impart a very distinctive flavor to salmon. Salmon and fennel work, by the way. Fennel. Yep, fennel, fennel is a great underutilized uh, product. So we are creating steam. So we need to add liquid to create steam. If you, I suppose, wanted to be very, very, very ultra healthy, water would work. Um, if you make fish stock or have fish stock, fish stock would be great. I'm going to use a little bit of white wine, right? And, and we're not going <laughs> to use a whole lot. We just want a little liquid in there to create steam. And uh, I know everybody here, nobody here can finish a bottle of wine, right? <laughs> no, it never happens. So stick the cork in it, throw it back in your fridge, cook with those. Cook with those open bottles of wine because they're probably not so great to drink after you've opened the bottle. All right, so now we're ready for our fish. And, and Pre Professor Riley actually called around today and found a beautiful, beautiful piece of red sockeye salmon. Isn't that great? Look at the color on that. That's just magnificent. Now, this is bigger than my paper. So I have abominated this beautiful fish fillet by scoring the tail and I'm just going to fold this over. I'm not proud of that. I'm doing that <laughs> sheerly out of necessity. So as Gaffier, the great French chef, is probably spinning in his grave right now. So now we're going to start our top layer. And again, you've got a lot of flexibility here. Um, I know that Professor Riley likes mushrooms, so we're going to lay some mushrooms mm. across the top. Do you need help? of our fish fillet. The great thing about what I did to the tail is we can actually tuck things underneath there. How about that? They're not going anywhere. Uh, great opportunity to go out into your garden and use some of those fresh herbs that you're growing. We've got some nice fresh dill. We're just going to lay these across the top. I am going to remove them. But if you want to serve that as part of the, of the fish, you could probably stem them, chop them up nice and fine. Don't ask me why this is. I, I don't know that I can answer this, but I love thyme. I just love the flavor of fresh thyme. So I'm going to add a little bit of fresh thyme to this. I really can't explain it. Uh, does everybody have a favorite herb? I, I really like thyme. We're just going to lay that across the top. And then we're going to finish this off with a couple of lemon slices. Because lemon and fish are just always going to work really well. So we do need to be sure that we have enough liquid in there. Mine kind of ran off on me, so I'm just going to add a little bit of mo more. But we don't want to overly saturate it, just enough to generate a little bit of steam. So we're going to simply fold our top over. 
and then we're going to begin crimping the edges and you want to start down here what is the point of the heart and we're just going to fold these up and there's nothing magical or difficult about this we're just going to try to seal this edge And it is important that we get a nice tight seal on this. So I always go back and do it again. I've got a lot of fish and things in this packet. Probably don't have enough paper. All right, so we have a nice sealed edge on there. And those of you that are kind of following your recipe, I do have an optional step in there. And if you were inclined to do so, and your packet was small enough to fit in a saute pan, you could actually put this on top of the stove, get a nice hot fire underneath it, and you'll see the packet blow up. And then you can put it in the oven. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to put it right into the oven. And you want to make sure that your oven's pretty hot. Remember, we've got to generate steam. We're not slow cooking this. We've got to get some heat underneath there to generate the steam. So I've got my oven set on about 450 degrees. And we're just going to pop this in the oven. And a great guideline for fish, right? Remember, I'm teaching you technique, not a recipe. About 10 minutes per inch of fish. That's a very good guideline to judge how long to cook your fish. So we're just going to pop this into the oven. And this should be ready in about 20 minutes. So you have a nice, healthy salmon dish. Um, pretty quick and easy to do. Um, lots of great looking fish apparently at the market right now. So any questions about that particular dish? Yes. Uh, width, thank you. 10 inch per inch of thickness. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So you can do this with just about any type of fish, by the way. Any type of fish lends itself pretty well to this technique. All right. Um, so are you ready? You want to start uh, plating that? Okay. Yep, I will. This, this pan may be hot, so just be very careful about touching your arms on this. Will you do the honors and remove all of our aromatics, or shall I? I think I just did it, didn't I? <laughs> All right, there you go. Perfect. All right, the other question I get a lot, too, about cooking fish, uh, skin off or skin on, that's kind of a preference. Um, there's good things from a culinary standpoint to say about cooking fish with the skin on. It doesn't curl up as much. You don't get as much shrinking up. Um, some people are actually eating fish skin now, especially on the grilled fish. I mean, this obviously isn't a grilled piece of fish, but, you know, when you're cooking at home, that's what you're doing. You're cooking for yourself. You don't have to impress anybody. You don't need to follow a trend. So skin on, skin off, whatever you prefer. Personally, I'm a skin off guy, unless the, the fish is grilled and it gets nice and crispy. But uh, that's just me. All right, the next dish I wanted to show you, 
uh, Professor Riley asked me to, to show you something that was a little on the lighter side and a little on the quick side. Yes. The, the root, the, the bulbous root that's almost celery-ish looking, that, that almost has the dill looking fronds on the end. Yes. Yep, no, it actually does not. That is just simply to keep our paper packet from catching on fire or, or popping open. Um, yeah. Good question. So Professor Riley asked me to show you how to do a very, very simple vinaigrette. Um, <coughs> because as we know, probably ranch dressing is probably a little overused in the Midwest. I have a bottle in my refrigerator at home, so, so don't feel bad about that. But there are other uh, quite remarkable ways to make salad dressing, especially in the advent of all the cool little power tools we now have in our kitchens. So if you don't have one of these, go out and get one. Some of you might have a, a very powerful blender. That will work as well. You'll just have to make bigger batches, right? Oh, well. <laughs> So we're going to make what's called an emulsified vinaigrette. So again, this is a technique. Vinaigrette salad dressings are traditionally three parts oil, one part vinegar, or uh, whatever the acidic ingredient is. So I've actually taken vinegar out of this recipe, and we're going to use freshly squeezed lemon juice. So, And yes, I actually was standing back there squeezing the lemons earlier. This did not come out of a bottle. Um, we're going to use olive oil in this particular application. And for those of you that like to go out and buy really, really, really nice olive oils, this is the thing to use them for. And I'll be honest with you, I do not cook with my uber expensive olive oil. I save these for things like this. So number one, I can taste the olive oil, and I don't break the olive oil down with heat. So pick a really, really nice olive oil for this. And then you need an emulsifying agent. So in this particular recipe, I've identified mustard as an emulsifying agent. But you can actually use honey, and garlic will actually do the job as well. So the emulsifying agent is going to actually hold this together. And believe it or not, I made this probably close to about 5 o'clock. It is not separated out. I didn't doctor this. Um, I didn't put a hydrocolloid in there, but I thought about it. <laughs> because I wanted you to see that this will hold it hold together. Hydrocolloids, by the way, are things like xanthan gum um, that will actually form the emulsification. But it's the mustard and the immersion blender. So that can sit for a while, and it will not separate. You know what I mean? You, you combine oil and vinegar, you let it sit, they separate. This will not because of the emulsifying agent. So I've got about a quarter of a cup of fresh squeezed lemon juice in here, and I've got about a tablespoon of Dijon mustard. And I actually have a little bit of garlic in there as well. So I'm going to get in here with my stick blender, and I'm going to start mixing this up, and then I'm going to add my olive oil in a very, very slow stream, and that's kind of the trick to this. So I'm going to go ahead and get this going. And this is one ounce of lemon juice. No, it's not. It's two ounces of lemon juice. This is about six ounces of olive oil. So that's true to the three to one ratio.
there you go. Isn't that cool? That just impresses me every time. Boy, I always <laughs> think, man, it might not work, but it does. So, so that's just lemon juice, Dijon mustard, olive oil. That's all that's in there. And garlic. And a little bit of garlic, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, so, so that is what's on the salad that's being passed around. It's actually this batch that I uh, made a little bit earlier. So we put together a very simple little salad. We've actually got a nice blend of some organic baby lettuces. Um, we've added some toasted walnuts in there, so that's a great way to get your walnuts into your diet. And all I did was put them into a dry pan on top of the stove, um, a stainless steel saute pan. I turn the heat up pretty high. I try to keep them moving around and they really don't take very long. Uh, just make sure that you don't burn them. Um, I cook a lot by smell, believe it or not, as weird as that sounds. And as those walnuts toast, they'll start, you know, releasing those oils. They'll become very aromatic and uh, it never hurts to pick one out of there and taste it to see if they're where you want to get them. Just don't burn them because you can burn walnuts. Um, so if we were to taste this salad dressing right now, the lemon would actually be a little muted. So we've kind of got to punch that up a little bit. So I love lemon zest. Um, it kills me anytime I see somebody cut a lemon and squeeze it or whatever and throw it away because there's so much good left behind. This is a zester. You need one of these too. Um, and uh, it's a pretty simple tool to use. I don't know if you can see that. If you can come up on that, that's it. So keep it right there and I'll show you how to use this tool. Okay, so we're just going to press it up against the lemon like so, and with kind of medium pressure, we're just going to turn down from top to bottom, and you'll see all that peel come off the lemon. And you only get one pass on that. You don't want to start doing two or three passes on that, because all we're trying to get off this lemon is the colored portion of the peel because that's where the lemon oil is. And, and you may or may not know lemon oil is pretty powerful stuff. It's going to give a lot of flavor. If you start digging down into the white part, the white part is the pith, and that's bitter. We do not want that. So just one pass around the, the lemon, you're going to get plenty of lemon peel here. And we're just going to finish off our dressing by adding the lemon zest to this and you could actually chop this up a little bit if you don't like the larger pieces in there. We're going to add a little bit of chopped herb. For this I like parsley. I like Italian parsley, flat leaf parsley because it's not as wet. It's easier to cut and I, I think it actually has flavor. Curly parsley, not as much flavor Italian parsley a little bit of flavor and don't forget just a little bit of salt and we're just going to combine these ingredients and there you have it. You have a nice emulsified lemon vinaigrette and you can actually store this for a couple of days in the refrigerator and you can actually eat this on your fish as well. This would be very nice on there. Mm -hmm. So any questions? for me. I'm going to thank you for your attention yeah. and Yay. thank you, Professor. Yeah, we want to just say thank you everyone for coming. Um, we will have another fish coming out of the oven soon if anyone wants more. Um, <laughs> so just give us a few more minutes, um, but we're going to hang around and ask some questions as well. So thanks for coming. Um, just wanted to remind everyone in July, so uh, we are going to be talking about using fresh garden produce. So we will have a lot of things in season at that time. So we're going to do some, some fun things with cooking with things that you can grow in your own backyard. So thank you. We look forward to seeing you guys again.